Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or uneffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Premier Roy Chattery. Uh, he's part of Uremic Vascular Biology. Uh, he's a professor of medicine uh, in the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at uh, UNC Chapel Hill Kidney Center. He's a co-director as well of the Kidney Center there. So. Prabir, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, so what's, uh, what's your background? What got you interested in working on kidneys? And what's your like personal background as well? Sure, yeah. I grew up in India and went to medical school uh, in India. I then uh, did a lot of my initial training uh, in Scotland, in Aberdeen, at the University of Aberdeen, where I did my initial internal medicine training, uh, a master's and a PhD, and some initial training in nephrology. And uh, I then came across to the U.S. in 1993, did a fellowship at the Beth Israel Hospital, and since then have really uh, been in academic nephrology. My main clinical interest uh, is in kidney transplant. So I'm a transplant nephrologist at the clinical level, but at the research level, a lot of our work has really been in the area of trying to understand what happens to blood vessels and to the heart when you have kidney failure? And in particular, we've been very interested in dialysis vascular access, uh, which is uh, really a lifeline, if you will, for patients on hemodialysis. Uh, and I've also been very interested in product development new, of new drugs, devices, and biologics both at a local level in our lab and at a national level through the Kidney Health Initiative and the American Society of Nephrology. Well, it gives us a lot of things to talk about. So I, I wanted to ask you first about kidney disease. What, how does it manifest early on and then later on? What is it like and how does it happen? Yeah, so that's probably one of the biggest problems with kidney disease that uh, I think all of us would love, love to get the word out about which is that in the early and even in the moderate severity stages, it really doesn't have any symptom. And that's why it's so important to get your kidneys checked out through a simple blood and urine test, particularly if you're in a high-risk group. And the high-risk groups are if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, 
if you have a family history of kidney disease uh, and also if you're African American because of uh, a greater severity of kidney disease in uh, the African American population. So get yourself checked out if you have any of those any of those risk factors. So in later stages what what happens what are the first symptoms that something's wrong with someone? Right, yeah. So so at, when your kidney disease is more advanced and this could be as late as in some people when you have only you know, 15 to 20 percent of your kidney function left. The symptoms are that you start retaining fluid. You can feel short of breath because of the retention of fluid. You start feeling unwell. You can often become anemic because the kidneys actually produce a hormone that uh, stimulates your red blood cells uh, or stimulates your bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. And then as Time goes on and you're down to, say, 10% of kidney function. You can have nausea. You have a lot of itching at times. Uh, You don't sleep well. You just feel tired and worn out. But, you know, again, I just want to emphasize that it is so often asymptomatic. And every nephrologist will tell you about patient after patient who's come into the emergency room just because they haven't been feeling well for the last two or three weeks. And then when we do a blood test, they have less than 5% of kidney function left and have to oh, start wow. onto hemodialysis. So it really is something that for the most part can be asymptomatic. What, what goes into the calculation of kidney function? What generates that percentage? Right. So so that's uh, uh, it's a simple question, but it's a very important and I would say currently very topical question. So what goes into that calculation of that 5 and 10 percent, that's so the 5 and 10 percent is really what we call the glomerular filtration rate. So a normal person would have a GFR, if you will, of let's say 100. And if that goes down to 5 to 10 percent, so 5 to 10 milliliters per minute, that's when you're in need of renal replacement therapy, uh, dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, or a transplant. What goes into that calculation is really something called creatinine. And creatinine is a biomarker that at the end of the day is excreted predominantly by the kidneys. And so as your kidney function decreases, your creatinine goes up. But creatinine isn't really that sensitive, I would say, to identify particularly small degrees of kidney dysfunction, if you if you will. And that's why it's been converted into this GFR estimate. So it's, a, it's called an eGFR, your estimated GFR based on your creatinine plugged into some complex calculations. There are other things that go into that calculation. Uh, So things like age and gender and also race. And so the reason why it's so topical is that if you are African-American, your GFR actually comes out as being a little bit better as compared to if you had the same creatinine, but were actually not African-American. And a lot of us, uh, including my, uh, including myself, feel that it's really time that that race-based correction uh, is perhaps not included anymore. The American Society of Nephrology and the National Kidney Foundation together have put together a task force that is looking at this. They're also looking at Uh, what potentially needs to take its place. And that's a work in progress. But uh, you touched, you asked a very simple question, but uh, I've given you a long answer because it is something that has very much been in the news currently. There was a New York Times article about two months ago on this issue. And a lot of people who are far more knowledgeable than me on this issue have uh, been thinking a lot about it. I've also heard about uh, albumin showing up in the blood or in the urine, I'm sorry, in higher concentrations. 
you know, for diabetics, I guess there's also sugar that comes into the urine. What, what kind of biomarkers could be used to get a better description of what's going on with someone's kidneys maybe earlier on than just low function? Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. Right. So, uh, you know, when you asked me this question earlier, I said that if you are at risk of kidney failure uh, based on the uh, d- different parameters that I spoke about, get your blood and urine checked. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's really the combination of the serum creatinine in your blood that's converted into the GFR and the amount of protein leakage in your urine that at the present time is probably the best determinant of how, let me take a step back. Sure. The combination of your serum creatinine, which converts into your glomerular filtration rate and the amount of leakage of albumin that you have in your urine, when put together, that's probably the best predictor of how your kidneys are going to do in the future. And we've actually put the two of them together in something called the kidney failure risk equation. And when I say we, it's it's really the kidney community, particularly Dr. Tangri up in Canada, who's done this. And the kidney failure risk equation can come up and say that in two years, you've got a 10% chance of reaching dialysis, or in five years, you've got a 25% chance. And uh, I think that uh, we are beginning to use this combination of creatinine and protein leak or albumin leak in your urine more. I think we need to use it more than we're currently using it. But I would also say that this is the first step towards a more precision-based approach to kidney disease. And my hope definitely for the the future is that uh, it's not just the albuminuria and the creatinine that we use to risk stratify patients, but rather we also use a whole host of other clinical, demographic, biological, and molecular parameters so that we really try and move towards a much more precision medicine, individualization of care, uh, artificial intelligence, if you you wish, if we're putting together a lot of parameters, that we move towards that sort of approach for risk stratification of patients who have kidney disease. Because that's the most important thing, right? You have 100 patients who've got a mild degree of kidney function, kidney dysfunction, what you want to identify very early on, you want to be able to pull out those people who are most likely to progress aggressively to end-stage kidney disease requiring dialysis or a transplant because you could then target those patients either for a more aggressive process of care pathway or you could treat them with newer drugs that we're very lucky. We've got a lot of new drugs coming out currently for prevention of the progression of kidney disease, or you could enrich these patients and put them into clinical trials because you know that they're going to have a high event rate. All right. So what happens when the kidneys start to fail? It sounds like they're letting substances like albumin and creatinine through when they shouldn't normally, but also that the, I guess the, the rate of filtration also slows down. So it's leaky and slow. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Right. So the the leakage of albumin into the urine is really just, uh, it's it's a sign of bad things. And it's a sign really 
of the filter of the of the kidney, if you will, not working that well. If you put together the totality, if you will, of what happens when the kidney stops functioning or doesn't function so well, one could describe it as follows. So number one, a major role of the kidney is to get rid of the toxic byproducts of metabolism, right? The urea uh, and really thousands of other particles, the indoxal acetates, the para cresols and lots of other things that we probably don't even know are out there. So when your kidney stops functioning, these substances accumulate, these uremic solutes accumulate in the blood, and ultimately they result in your patient not feeling well, your patient having an itch, your patient feeling nauseated, your patient feeling confused, right? So that's number one. It's the kidney is responsible for getting rid of the bad stuff in your blood. The other thing that the kidney does is that it gets rid of fluid, right? So we all pass urine. So if you drink a lot of water, you pass a lot of urine. It's a hot summer day and you're running half a marathon, you don't pass any urine. So it's got, the kidney is, is absolutely beautiful, right? It's amazing, intricate, wonderful at regulating your fluid balance. But when you have kidney failure, damage to your kidney due to diabetes or hypertension or glomerulonephritis or a genetic condition like polycystic kidney disease, your kidney doesn't do that. And in most cases, you tend to accumulate fluid because you can't get rid of the fluid because your kidney isn't functioning. And then beyond these two main functions, right, uh, which is uh, excretion and fluid regulation, the kidney also functions as an endocrine organ. So it produces um, a hormone called erythropoietin, which stimulates the bone marrow to produce red cells. So if your kidneys fail, you're not producing as much erythropoietin as you should, and therefore you become anemic. The kidneys produce or they, they activate a hormone uh, called vitamin D. So we all know about vitamin D, but it actually, uh, it's not just a vitamin. It's actually also uh, a hormone that has many important uh, effects on the bone. It regulates calcium and phosphate and lots of other things. And so again, when your kidney fails, you end up getting bone disease, for example, uh, because uh, you're not producing enough enough vitamin D uh, and you get a whole series when, of complex when you say pathways. When you say produce it, are you meaning the bioactive form? or like The bioactive the, form, yes. So it's what, the about one, the, what about the liver, though? Like which What's the dynamic of vitamin D3 creation? Is it the bioactive form happen in the liver or the kidneys? Yeah, so the the liver produces the 25-hydroxy form, but that that vitamin D, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, has to undergo 1-alpha-hydroxylation in the kidney to become active. So it's the lack of that activation of the 25-hydroxy form in the kidney that causes the problems. So what happens to people then that have uh, kidney disease or on dialysis? Like, what do they do about their vitamin D3 availability? If they're, I mean, can they go out in the sun more? Will that take care of it? Or like, what do they do? Even if they supplement with vitamin D3, it probably won't be converted very well into the active form and it'll be wasted. Right. So we, so we often supplement those patients with the active 125 form. So we use calcitriol, but they're also intravenous analogs. Uh, that can be used. So when patients are on dialysis, you're very, you're absolutely correct. The the dialysis, let's say hemodialysis, can clear the blood of the toxic waste products of some of them because uh, 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 the kidneys do a much better job as compared to the dialysis filter. Uh, the dialysis. Uh, uh, process can also pull water out of the body so you can get rid of the fluid, but it doesn't, it can't obviously give you erythropoietin or the activated form of vitamin D back. So we give that as part of the di- dialysis procedure. And most patients who are on hemodialysis receive injections of erythropoietin and receive injections of the activated vitamin D. What shows up in the uh the urine of someone that uh, 
well, I guess they don't produce very much or right. sometimes none, none at all. But yeah. I mean, what, what I mean in the blood, what shows up, what compounds show up in higher levels that don't normally show up in someone with a healthy kidney set? Right. So the way that I, so the simplest ones, of course, are the biomarkers that we use to assess kidney function. So if you have, you have end stage kidney disease, your creatinine is going to be between 10 to 20, whereas some a normal person's creatinine would be 1, 1.2, for example. Uh, the blood urea nitrogen level normally is under 20. That can be between 100 to 200 in somebody with kidney failure. So those are the two biomarkers that are most commonly measured that are increased when you have kidney failure. But That's just the tip of the iceberg, because what we really need to focus on is are all the other toxic waste products of metabolism that we don't really measure, but which could be increased or very likely are increased in a patient with kidney failure that could be causing a lot of the side effects or the symptoms that that patient has for example, feeling unwell or damaging the blood vessels. So these are things, uh, and I mentioned a couple of them before. So these are molecules like the indoxyl acetates, for example, or the paracresols, and the octopamines. And then there are just thousands of other things that would come up if you look at uremic serum uh, under a mass, uh, using mass spec, and there's actually a large European consortium called Eurotox that uh, uh, is looking at these uh, different molecules that are increased uh, in the uremic state, um, TMAO, trimethyl, but TMAO is another, is another thing that uh, is another molecule that we're looking at. And uh, actually at UNC, uh, Tom Hostetter, who's one of... Uh, who's a very respected uh, nephrologist, a previous president of the American Society of Nephrology, has a huge expertise in this area. And uh, we will hopefully be teaming up with him as well. So, all right. And then for uh, dialysis, you mentioned hemodialysis, I guess it's peritoneal and hemodialysis. What's the difference between the two types of dialysis? And then I want to ask you some questions surrounding that. Sure, but I'm, I'm I'm going to pivot a little bit and just say that Hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, they keep you alive, but to a very great extent, they don't allow you to live because there are uh, shortcomings more with hemodialysis as compared with peritoneal dialysis. And so the ideal form of renal replacement therapy without question is a kidney transplant. So having made that point, uh, the differences in the two forms of dialysis are as follows. So hemodialysis or blood dialysis is basically a procedure where we take, uh, when I say we, the dialysis technicians and nurses put needles into a vascular axis, which is one of the areas that we're interested in. It's often uh, something called a fistula, which is a big enlarged vein in the forearm or upper arm where an artery has been connected to a superficial vein surgically. And so that vein becomes big and fat. And because veins are superficial, needles can be put into that fistula, arteriovenous fistula, or AVF is what we call it. And then uh, what happens is that blood is sucked out from that fistula by a pump on a dialysis machine, it's run through a special filter which, or artificial kidney, which is the heart, which is at the heart of hemodialysis. And the blood runs through thousands of semi-permeable hollow fibers in one direction, let's say from top to bottom. And at the same time, the dialysis machine, it passes dialysate fluid in a countercurrent mechanism pathway around the hollow fibers going from down to up or in the opposite direction. And what happens within that dialysis filter, if you will, is that you have a diffusion of the bad things in the blood. So the BUN, the creatinine, the high levels of potassium, 
the high levels of acid, for example, and that goes, and this is a simple explanation from the blood into the dialysate because there's a low concentration of these substances in the blood, uh, uh, sorry, a high concentration in the blood of the uremic patient, but low concentrations in the dialysate. And at the same time, good things like bicarbonate to neutralize the acid in the blood goes from the dialysate into the blood. And at the same time, the machine can actually exert a negative pressure across these hollow semi-permeable hollow fibers, which can pull out the correct amount of fluid, say two liters or three liters, or if we're dialyzing somebody who's had a lot of salt and has not been as restrictive uh, with their diet, we have to pull out a lot more fluid, maybe four or five liters. Uh, And then the purified blood goes back into the patient through the same vascular access. So that's hemodialysis. Peritoneal dialysis is when we place a plastic tube into the perito- into the abdomen, into the peritoneal cavity, and we then pass dialysate fluid, which is again uh, almost always a dextrose-containing fluid with very little or with no urea and creatinine, and What happens in peritoneal dialysis is that when we put in, let's say, two liters of fluid into the peritoneal cavity, the peritoneal membrane does the work of the semi-permeable hollow fiber that I spoke about for hemodialysis. And so you have this passage of the bad stuff from the blood into the fluid in the peritoneal membrane. Uh, And in addition, because the fluid that we put in has dextrose, so it has a high osmotic load, it pulls in or it drags in fluid from the blood into the uh, peritoneal cavity because water will always flow from a region of higher concentration of water into a region of lower concentration of water. And the dialysate fluid, because it has a lot of dextrose, is relatively more concentrated. And so it can pull water from the blood into the peritoneal cavity. So what are some of the nuances of dialysis in order to make it customized to a particular person, you know, or throughout a dialysis session? You know, what is the fluid used? What is taken off? Does it change throughout the session? as the concentration changes of what's being filtered? Right. So the short answer is we'd like to get to that place where we are continuously monitoring what's happening in the blood and thereby altering both the peritoneal dialysis process and the hemodialysis process throughout. I think we're trying to get there but we're not there yet. And so we're still at the present time writing out a hemodialysis prescription based upon the blood levels at the start of dialysis or the blood levels that were done, say, a week ago. And uh, so we're sort of, I would say, in 2021, and I'm going to be a little bit hard on the dialysis on, on myself, you know, we, I think we, sh- uh, you know, my dream definitely would be for us to uh, be perhaps in a slightly different place. Now, the reason I, I guess, was hard on myself, as I, sh- as I think we should be to some extent, is because we are trying to change this, right? So, why should patients go in? to an in-center hemodialysis unit three times a week to get four hours of dialysis three times a week. So that's 12 hours instead of 168 hours of clearance, which your kidney would give you over a one-week period. Uh, Why do we have to compress it all into four hours, which means that patients often feel weak and tired out and unwell for the rest of the day? right? So that quality of life goes. Why can't we have more people who either dialyze with peritoneal dialysis, which can be done at home 
is more continuous. So you can do it every night instead of just three times a week, or you can do it through the day and through the night. So why can't we have more people on peritoneal dialysis? Why can't we have more people on home hemodialysis, which is really just 1%, 1 to 2% of the total number of patients on hemodialysis. And why can't we go a step further as we're trying to? Why can't we have a portable kidney machine? Why can't we have wearable dialysis? And again, there have been some initial studies from Seattle and through Victor Gura and Jonathan Himmelfarb and the Kidney Research Institute that have actually done a clinical trial on some people who are on uh, who have uh, uh, who have done a clinical trial with wearable dialysis, but then why can't we go even a step beyond that and have implantable dialysis or a bioengineered kidney? And the reason I'm saying all of this is that the American Society of Nephrology has partnered with the FDA. It has partnered with Health and Human Services to come out with public-private partnerships such as the Kidney Health Initiative and the Kidney Innovation Accelerator that are trying very hard to try and change the current construct of three times a week in-center hemodialysis and push us all towards portable, wearable, implantable dialysis. Uh, And uh, in order to do this, we very much want to put out the word that, you know, The kidney world is open for business. We want people from engineering and from other specialties within medicine and outside of medicine to come in. And we have created a roadmap for innovative renal replacement therapy through the Kidney Health Initiative. And the Kidney Innovation Accelerator has just put out a $10 million artificial kidney prize that is hoping to push us towards, uh, again, wearable and implantable uh, dialysis. Well, what about kidney organoids and the research side of things? Are you familiar with, yep. you know, with everything going on? Like what, what right. is, what's being made, what's being looked at? Right. So the reason that I'm speaking so much uh, about uh, the innovative roadmap for renal replacement therapy is that I've been very involved with the kidney Health Initiative, and uh, and I'm also on the steering committee of the Kidney Innovation Accelerator. And the answer to your question is uh, yes. I, I think that the ability to regenerate a kidney or the ability to create uh, an artificial kidney, it's not just about devices, right? It's also about it's about creating renal organoids, which then potentially can come together to form a kidney. And uh, there are lots of people uh, that are trying to uh, develop kidney organoids and also a lot of people uh, who are trying to decellularize a pig kidney, for example, and then seed it with stem cells that will then be influenced by the matrix of the kidney, the collagen matrix that's left behind when you decellularize a kidney. And really, it's almost like magic that when you do this, you actually find different types of kidney cells. So the kidney has 27 different types of cells. One of them, for example, is a porocyte. And when you inject these decellularized kidneys just with, uh, uh, let's say, a stem cell type, I'm being very broad, uh, that cell, when it latches on to the part of the kidney where earlier there was in fact a podocyte that has now been decellularized, that cell transforms into a cell that expresses podocyte, which is what podocytes express. So you could say, gosh, this is sort of like magic, but we believe that the architecture of the kidney that's left behind could potentially be giving the right signals to these early stage cells or iPSCs to actually transform into the right sort of kidney cell. And uh, there are a lot of groups that are involved either in this decellularization and repopulation or in kidney organoids. So Jennifer Lewis at the Broad Institute, uh, uh, 
uh, Harold Ott at the MGH, Melissa Little in Australia, John Rabelink in, in the Netherlands, and there are lots of other places. If you're able to produce in a scaffolding some stem cells for kidneys, what would you do? Inject them into someone's kidneys that whose kidneys have failed and see if they, you know, they come back to life? Or how would you use this as a therapy? Right. So I think there are two ways that uh, one would use this. One is to uh, decellularize a kidney and then potentially take iPSCs from an individual potentially and uh, inject them and see whether you end up with a with a kidney that is functional that could then be used. The other way for this technology and I'm going to I'm going to mention a company called Inrigen. I I do want to declare that I have a conflict. I'm uh, uh, on their advisory board, but when I was in Arizona and even now in Chapel Hill, there is a trial going on where the goal is uh, to really do a biopsy on the kidney of a patient. Do the biopsy. Uh, do a kidney biopsy in a patient whose kidney is failing, take those cells, treat them in a particular way, and then re-inject them back into the kidney. And the hope is, and there is a little bit of a black box uh, for me as well, in terms of what actually happens, but the hope is that these treated cells when re-injected back into the kidney will produce the right milieu of cytokines and other mediators to prevent the further progression of kidney disease. So that I say, uh, I, that would be the second way that you could use it. And of course, you could, uh, I'm sure, produce these cells outside. You could get these cells even, I'm presuming, without having to uh, uh, do a biopsy. Uh, and uh, that would be another way that you could perhaps um, uh, stimulate uh, or regenerate a kidney. What about you know people that have passed away and resecting their kidneys and looking at the structure and seeing if they had kidney failure? What does that look like physically in the kidney? Right. So you know we we've obviously done a done a fair amount of that over the years in terms of uh, look. And I may not have got the question right, but I'm reading your question as. Are there lessons to be learned from looking at the kidneys of people who passed away? Is that correct? Yeah, because if they had kidney disease at whatever stage, you know, you wouldn't see it necessarily while they're alive. But once they've passed, you know, if, if you can get access to the kidneys and look at them, how's the morphology changed in a diseased kidney? You know, what how's the structure changed? What can you tell us what's going what's going on? Yeah. yeah. So I think we've done I think we've done a lot a lot of that and uh uh, you know what we usually find in an end stage kidney is that there is a there is a replacement of the different uh, structural elements of the kidney with fibrous tissue so you get glomerulosclerosis uh, you have interstitial fibrosis you have tubular atrophy you often end up with arteriosclerosis the problem in a way to that approach is that it's probably too late, right? It, it, almost regardless of whether you have diabetes or hypertension or a previous inflammation of the kidneys or a whole spectrum of kidney diseases, by the time you've got 5% to 3% of kidney function left, your kidneys really are filled up with scar tissue. So we obviously need to find out, your question's a really important one. We obviously, I think, need to find out what's happening within the kidney uh, before patients reach end-stage kidney disease. And there is currently ongoing a very exciting initiative that's being run and funded by the National Institutes of Health, so by NIDDK, which is the sort of National Institute of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Diabetes and Kidney I'm saying this wrong. Uh, national, basically, the the kidney institute that deals with the national institute that deals with kidney disease it also deals with diabetes, uh, and it's called NIDDK, and also deals with digestive disorders. But they have initiated uh, the kidney precision medicine project. I think this is a hugely important 
initiative. I think it's going to give us information that will change the way that we take care of kidney patients in the in the future. And the goal of this kidney precision medicine project is really exactly what you were talking about: is to take is to do biopsies in patients with early diabetic kidney disease, for example, uh, to do biopsies in patients with acute kidney injury, to do biopsies from patients with normal kidneys. So ideally, that so that would most likely be uh, living donor kidneys when donors are. Uh, are donating their kidneys and then use all of this biopsy information, one, to create an atlas of what a normal kidney looks like, and then to create an atlas, if you will, or to identify the changes in a diseased kidney and to do this using really state-of-the-art techniques. So this is and not just about histology, it's about immunohistology, it's about proteomics, it's about metabolomics, it's about every single, uh, it's about looking at the transcriptome, it's about really using cutting edge ultra, ultra structural techniques to learn as much as we can about what the normal kidney looks like and what a diseased kidney in its earlier stages in particular would look like. I think that's going to change. Uh, It's going to allow us to pull out a whole host of different molecules and different pathways. And it's going to allow us, uh, I hope, to intervene early on and to be able to risk stratify patients early on, which is what we were talking about right at the beginning as well. Yeah, well, very good, Prabir. We're we're just about out of time, but what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and check into your resources? Right. So, if you go to, uh, I would like to suggest two, three places really, uh, which would cover uh, some of the things that we spoke about. And heck, we we didn't really speak too much about our work, but we spoke about about the work that we're doing. But we spoke about a lot of interesting things. And we spoke a lot about some of the things that I'm involved with at a national level. But please do check out if you're interested in what we're doing at the UNC Kidney Center at Chapel Hill. Please just put in uh, uh, UNC Kidney Center and that'll take that'll take you to our website. And we're also on Twitter uh, at UNC Kidney, UNC K-I-D-N-E-Y. In addition, I, and I'm going to wear my American Society of Nephrology counselor hat here. Please do go to the American Society of Nephrology website. We're doing a lot of exciting things through ASN, which is the largest professional kidney organization in the world with over 20,000 members. In particular, if you're interested in the science, look up the Kidney Health Initiative, uh, either through the ASN website or directly uh, and we and uh, uh, also do look up the kidney innovation accelerator where you'll find details about the artificial kidney prize but again the ASN website the kidney health initiative website and the UNC kidney center website lots of exciting things there follow us at UNC kidney on twitter very good well Prabir, thank you for coming on the podcast i appreciate it All right, Richard. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.